So let me now introduce Cedric Hudgings, who, did I say that right? <laughs> uh, the CEO and co-founder of Wittings. And he is working on a smartwatch, dare I call it that, a device for health and wellness. And um, could we get his, the images of his? OK. Oh, great. There we go. So we see an image there. And then we're also joined by um, Nikolev um, Vit. I, I'm going to mess up your name, right? <laughs> the, uh, the CEO of Braggy, who has a new device um, that's just coming out called the Dash. Um, so just to show you a couple of pictures, actually, why don't you go ahead, um, Cedric, and introduce what your product is and what it does. Thank you very much. Um, so Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, and thanks for uh, welcoming us. Uh, it's very hard to speak after what we saw. That, yeah. we, that is very spectacular. And actually, a lot of the things we do is to make things disappear. So it's really the opposite. Uh, what we've been uh, developing now for six years is uh, devices that uh, sense uh, a part of our health and build their connected health sensors, uh, who then build dashboards that we have on our iPhone, smartphone, and will uh, change the way we manage our own health tomorrow. And so we do things that uh, we are introducing uh, right now with activities, the next step of this wearable. And uh, we've worked hard on making this truly wearable. And uh, this uh, ecosystem or this industry of wearable, uh, so far for us, has uh, failed of really creating wearables, meaning device that you wear for a purpose and a primary purpose. And when we talk about watch, uh, obviously it's to have an obvious way to see uh, the time, uh, not go in the shade or press a button or having to recharge your device just to see the time. So, uh, and we call it so far smartwatch, but it really gave watch a bad, a bad name. So <laughs> we took the opposite approach. And, and the device you see is actually uh, is uh, embedded with a lot of sophisticated sensors, connectivity, but you do not see it. So it's a simple watch. And we make a genuine Swiss-made watch designed in, in France and a manufacturer next, uh, next door in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, but that happens to ha have all the sensors to measure your daily activity activity uh, and give you some metrics on some uh, daily advice that you can follow, uh, let's say, 10,000 steps a day, which is quite, quite common, common knowledge now. But having a metrics and being able to set some small objectives uh, is uh, changing our behavior on a step-by-step -step way. So these, these small trackers you see on the, on the bottom right uh, does measure your progress towards these, these goals day by day. And then all the rest is done on the, on the smartphone. So it detects uh, your uh, walking, but also running, swimming. So a lot of different you know, uh, fitness activity. But again, without speaking out or uh, crying out the tech aspect, because we believe that connected health can uh, serve you know, more than the geeks that uh, a lot of people. Yeah, so I think also maybe you could talk a little bit about the aesthetic development of this watch. Because, mm. you know, obviously the, the, the technology is, um, you know, cutting edge. But where this product really differentiates itself inside the wearables market is the, you know, what, what's the customer you're going after and why have you decided to make a beautifully handcrafted, you know, mm. kind of a, a watch that's bordering on a luxury item as opposed mm. to a plastic bracelet. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really uh, and and you mentioned just earlier this tech companies going into uh, to fashion. So we think we belong to, to this category, and we didn't want to take any shortcomings on, on developing a true watch. So we watch work with very uh, specialists on the on the face of the watch, on the mi materials. It's a high end steel leather that same as a luxury brands as, as Hermes. So really do not take any shortcomings on, on uh, developing a genuine uh, uh, watch, uh, but at the same time, you know, bringing all these services and, and, and technology. And we think making a beautiful device is, has two purposes. Obviously, we, we prefer to develop attractive devices that uh, people will see themselves wearing and you know, buying, because we live by developing and, and selling a product, for sure. But it also serves a purpose, which is a very uh, you know, benefits and value of these kind of devices, is that uh, they need to be worn on the long term to truly have a benefit on health. And we believe that we are uh, participating to a revolution on the way we will manage our health tomorrow. But this holds only if we do not develop gadgets, you know, things you play uh, uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's really one of the big failures today of the activity trackers is that uh, it makes you discover uh, the interest of tracking. But uh, for a lot of people, you drop do using it because you, you do not accept to go out of home and say, OK, I forgot my sensors. You don't care about your sensors. You care about your watch you know, or your clothes, your textile. But we think that's a way to go in 
making device that really will have an impact on our health. Right. Yeah, right now within the industry, there's basically a fall off rate of people will on average wear their you know, activity tracker for about six months and then they just stop using it. But mm -hmm. right, because it's just not integrated into their life seamlessly. Um, so now let's, uh, let's move on to, to Nikolai and um, let's talk about your new product, The Dash, and your development of your company called Braggy. Well, thank you. So we try not to make a product, but something that truly helps the people that use it. Um, this product just manifests that and we want to make it a device that people can be entertained by, they can listen to music. It's two wireless earplugs, no cables, and it works by itself. So you can listen to a thousand songs from the device itself. You'll be able to uh, measure uh, and track what you do, but it also com it communicates with you. So the device talks to you, tells you what to do better, or tells when you need to c take care of yourself. So. It is an experience that we're trying to generate, not a product. Um, and it's a very deep felt um, thing that I want to make. Uh, I think we have enough dashboards, we have enough things that we need to take care of every day. Um, I have two kids, I love my kids. Uh, it, it's the most amazing thing I've, I've ever been part of making. It was very easy, <laughs> kind of short too. Um, <laughs> So this, this is much more challenging than, than making my kids, but it's, it's nowhere near it. But I want to be part of my kids more. I want to be fitter. I want to be more able to do things. So we are not in the, in the measuring thing of business. We are in the ability thing. So we want to make people able to do the things that they really like to do. And I think that's, that might be the next step of measuring things. Like running at a certain speed doesn't make much sense, but what it enables me to do in short term and long term very much does so. Um, we're based in Munich. We love being here. Although I'm Danish, I've lived in Munich for 15 years now. And it's, it's a great place to be for doing this. Um, and we're very much enjoying ourselves going there. So in, in February, we, um, we took the project on Kickstarter after a year of development and it worked out quite well for us and was. Um, it was a good start, but it was also good feedback. Uh, th some things that we didn't expect, uh, but some things I'm very, very happy about is the great response, not just from males in their 35-year region, but from pretty much any age. Uh, older people seeing that they can use this for, for better hearing. Um, younger people that they see that they can use this for uh, enjoying the music, but also being free in what they do if they're skateboarders, if they're, they're skiers. So we make this product that is uniformly applicable uh, and needs to enjoy people from, from any age or any gender. Yeah, so you've taken on the space of the body of the ear, which I think is very interesting and uh, because, you know, historically, eyeglasses, which we're not going to talk about Google Glass on this panel. Um, but eyeglasses has been a space that has been a fashion accessory for a really long time. But when we think about technologies for the ear, usually it's much more about assistive and the sort of this notion of being sort of disabled through not being, and through to addressing that kind of, you know, the inner ear, usually we associate with that, uh, as opposed to like the kind of, you know, Beats by Dr. Dre type of headphones. And I just wanted to sort of you to talk a little bit more about how you merged at addressing that physical space on the body. And I know you also used to be the design director at Harman, so you have a lot of connection to sound and audio and the importance of that. Some of the greatest joys I've had is not just a visual one, but also an, an audible one. Um, I sincerely love going to, to concerts. I, I love music in general, uh, but also about speaking. And if you are in a room with another person and speaking to the person, you are looking at the certain person, but everything beyond that is blurry, it's gone. You only have a very s small area of focus. But when you hear things, you'll be able to hear things or people outside of the room. You'll be able to hear somebody walking past you. You'll be able to hear a cup falling on the floor, um, your kids screaming from the second floor, all kinds of things, but all at the same time. Your brain is created to understand a lot of parallel noises. If we're looking at the devices that we have today, they are limited to something that we sit in front of and use, but it just distracts us from everything else. I hope to generate a device that connects me with other people rather than distracts me from other people by hearing and by being able to use 
audio as a parallel interface. Fantastic. OK, so now let's, uh, let's open it up to everyone. And I think one of the interesting things that came out as I was researching all of your products um, is that a lot of the actual sensing technology and the sort of enabling platforms that you're using, there's a lot of crossover between the technology. And I think that that's really quite fascinating because the embodiment, the prioritization, the marketing, everything about it is entirely different. And I just wanted to kind of throw it out there. Let's talk about this notion of platforms in this space because this is a way that we get from a kind of single throwaway device into a system of, and a product that can, you know, is it possible to use technology to promote sustainability inside of the fashion and tech space? And, uh, and what does that mean in terms, of, in terms of your product development and your platform development? Anybody? Take it away. So I, th I think the sensor is not an important part. A sensor is something like a keyboard. It's something you press, it's something right. you do, and it, it, it creates an action. Um, if, if I'm frank, using it for health, you're using it for appearance, I'm using it for ability. It, it's different things, but we use the same kind of input for different things. Whether it being placed at the head, or on your foot, or on your arm, or on your body, it generates different input. It's a very complex thing. Just, it's just the same way of sensing it, but applied for very much different things. I think a lot of the... the I, think oops, I don't have a microphone. Yes. Hello? There yeah. we uh, A lot of in the, the early like, wearables that were strap-on type wearables, they, they used sensors as a means of gathering data. But for us in our design process, the goal was never to gather data. You hear phrases like the quantified self, where people are trying to quantify all kinds of different data. But um, even though we do use many of the same sensors in our products, we never put them in for the purpose of just simply capturing things. It's always to create an experience. And how do you create that experience best? Sometimes it's to use a sensor, sometimes it's to use data from another source. So. Like, like if you think about everything that is like electronics and software, you have all these inputs and then you have different kinds of output. And so this output can be anything, like you can capture the data and then relate to an app, and then the app transforms it into whatever you want. And as a, our friends that are doing the code workshop, right, everything we made is built with code. It's just that sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't see it. But uh, it's there and it's doing something. And sometimes it's doing it like secretly and sometimes it's doing it very openly. So, right. very much. Um, so you guys have both all been mentioning the word data. And this is, of course, you know, it's come up in multiple different talks throughout, throughout DLD. And uh, I think that you know, nowhere is data more personal than information about your body. And I, and I think that I'd like to hear from you guys your perspective on how we should create a system and a structure um, around that. What are our responsibilities as the makers of these devices? Um, as well as the, the whole notion of algorithms, because the individual data points are actually quite meaningless. Where things get tricky is the algorithms that we create meaning from them, whether it be uh, like understanding our health better, be, being predictive, what we're willing to share about our, our personal lives, all those kinds of things. So uh, let's, let's dig in a little bit about data. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's two separate questions, but the, the first one is um, uh, what are the new challenges, if any, uh, uh, caused by this uh, uh, new kind of data that we, we will keep on generating? And I think that by, by nature, uh, this data needs to be aggregated and correlated because, you know, it's one thing is to sense at, at a certain point uh, your activity level, your sleep, etc. But it, it's another thing and it really creates value when it's correlated with other data, environmental data and, you know, behavioral data. So the, you, you need to aggregate the data. But so uh, I think that it's not that new in the way that uh, having a, you know, a credit card or managing credit card data or, or a history of your mobile phone are very private and sensible data. And uh, so for which things we're incorporating in France and, and like in Germany, the, the rules are and the law is here and is applying to this uh, new kind of company such as us, which, which are creating health related data that it did apply to any private and sensible data. So I think, you know, it's not that a new problem. And uh, failing to comply with this law, I mean, make your, the company both illegal, but also, uh, of course, will disappear of the market because the last things that uh, you want as acquiring such device is to have your data being, uh, uh, being public or shared or uh, used against uh, your will. Now, I think that it's an interesting question because uh, sharing data then on your behalf, or, uh, you might want to share this data uh, with your doctor, 
nutrition, sometimes even with the community, uh, because it provides you some uh, uh, positive uh, social pressure, some motivation. So we have to find the right balance between obviously making uh, the, your data private, confidential, and you are the only one to manage your own data, but also enabling you to share your data you know, at the same time when it creates value for you. I take, a, I take a bit of a different standpoint. Um, I think every data that you create belongs to you. It, it makes it very simple to call it data because it's kind of, it's like something, right? Yeah. But what it really <laughs> is, it defines what you do, but also what your intentions are. So when you walk down the street and you've done things before in the same way, people can predict what you want to do next. People can predict that you're looking at the next shop window. People can predict if you're getting divorced. And they do that already with your credit card. So it's not just data, it's your life. It's your life that you're sharing. And I don't believe that that life should be shared with anyone unless you proactively choose to do so. And if we look at it on a different level, not just from me, but on a social cultural level, in, in Europe for the last 100 years, just in, in the round area where we are, we've seen dictatorships, we've seen people pressing other people. If you're able to predict what people do, if you're able to identify what people do, who are the freedom fighters of, fighters of tomorrow? We need to take care of our children that they can resist oppression, and we don't do that by sharing our lives. Do you think that there's a, a, will ever be a point where there's a convergence between the data that you're collecting and you're collecting and you're collecting through your separate devices where it becomes one single data bank, in a, in a sense? A, a collaboration there, but... Yeah, well, you know, for, <laughs> as an individual, right, if you have all these different devices, how do we, is that a good idea and how would we move towards that kind of space? Well, we don't collect a huge amount of data from, our, from the things that we're doing. For example, the, the Twitter skirt that we just showed, it, how do you know which tweets are going to show up? And people often say, well, that's an invasion of my privacy if somebody says something rude to me. But what we've done in the interface is we've defined it so you can invent any hashtag and tie your miniskirt to that hashtag. So you, it may be something that's only known to you because it's a very strange, obscure hashtag. But if it's your birthday and you actually want your friends to tweet silly things at you, then you share the hashtag. So in that sense, the data sharing that we're doing is more about being very overt with how you play with data, how it becomes fun, and how it because data, I mean, people do love to share certain things, but they don't always know what they're sharing. And I think that that's part of the key point is that you let people know when they're sharing and when they're not. Creating an empowerment through this understanding. I think yes. It's kind it's of like having control over your data mm -hmm. and what you are creating with it. Right. And, uh, and I think like there, there is like a movement that is like, oh, why am I uploading all this data to Facebook, to Instagram, to YouTube, to Twitter? But then I can, somebody can sell it to sell advertising spaces. And instead, I cannot even retrieve it unless I have to go to a very obscure process. And uh, so I think that that's what variable technology can do, is that we can use it to reappropriate our own data. And at the same time, we can decide when we want to switch it on and when we want to switch it off so that you can have your privacy is maintained. But then at the same time, when you want to disclose something, you have the structure to do it. So it's right, it's like an ecosystem where you have all the different devices, and then, yeah, the, the data you're collecting is yours. But I think that it's, people are seeing wearable technology as the next frontier for data we can gather and monetize, right. and that looks like a gold mine, right? But, and I also think that that's one of the reasons so many of these products are horrible, because it's exactly that. It's like, let's think how we can get that data, invent a product around that concept, it, which is ridiculous. Whereas right. if you're inventing a product that is meant to be delightful for somebody to use and actually provides a service to them, that's much better. So let's talk a little bit about business models and the kind of structure of the industry. Um, the fashion and technology worlds function in very different spheres with very different kind of priorities. And it can be a little bit awkward to try to kind of have these worlds come together. I think you, know, you two are working very much more on the cycle of fashion, you know, re releasing collections, doing the whole kind of runway show season thing. And you're working more in the sort of product development of a, of a tech product. You, you, know, you release the product, et cetera. And I think that, you know, how do we actually get these two massive billion dollar industries to start talking to each other and collaborating to, to get us to better places and better products, uh, primarily? And, and then also, um, you know, 
the fashion industry, uh, me being sort of deeply embedded in it right now in New York City, is, is in a bit of a crisis. I mean, we have this push towards fast fashion and, uh, you know, make more garments, consume more, have them cost more, you know, less and less. And, I th you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way in which we can start to think about this sort of crossover where, you know, like I mentioned before, the sustainability within these industries, what is the disruptive model that will kind of, that can potentially pull us out of that? I think you had touched on it a little bit more, but, but, but what are some of your stories and issues um, having, you know, crossing over, say, from the tech world into the fashion world and, and vice versa? First of all, if you wear it, it's fashion. Yeah. So if it's on your body, you've already accepted that I'm going to say this about myself and people are going to make judgments or make assumptions on who you are based on how you look. So I think when we first started designing wearable technology, people said, why, isn't the, why aren't you selling this in tech shops? We said, because it's not tech, it's fashion. You're wearing it. So if you're going to offer people something to wear, they're going to consume it like normal fashion. So they want to go to the boutique and they want to look at the nice clothes. Um, and ours, by necessity, are a kind of luxury fashion. And luxury, traditionally, is about heritage and craftsmanship and design. And we think that you, we can add one more dimension to that, which is capabilities and magic. So th these are things that you can add, bring to a luxury item that gives it more capabilities, and, but a longer life. So it, in a way, it could be an antidote to this fast fashion, where you, as soon as you get bored of something, you chuck it away, where as soon as you get bored with our dress, you could download a new pattern, you could download a new software update and do new things with it. So. <laughs> But when you're talking about making a sort of heritage brand, there you also have this the issue with a lot of technology around those notions of planned obsolescence, where we're we're sort of in this massive like consume, get the newest, latest gadget. Um, how do you kind of restructure your technology design to to kind of to support this notion of heritage? Well, we. Um we think that the, we're, we consciously put technology inside that's upgradable. First of all, um, most of the systems, <laughs> most of the systems we design are in, in, in a way modular, so that if there is a piece that is no longer compatible with the new iPhone, it could be removed and replaced and doesn't ruin your whole outfit. Um, all the garments you see over there have something inside that's called the brain. This is what I'm referring to. You can swap the brains from one to the other, and it will change it from being a Wi-Fi device to being a Bluetooth device, for example. And the other thing that we do is we, des we design over a platform that will go across many collections. So in normal fashion, it has a six-month cycle for, let's say, Pret-a-Porter. And you have to invent a whole new thing every six months. In our case, we are inventing new designs, but they're often based on a techno technological platform which had, took, had a much longer development process. So it could be a year, it could be two years. But then we use those new platforms in ways that are somewhat modular or moldable to create different designs from them. Yeah, because if you think, like, for example, some of the garments we have there, they have built-in sensors, but actually we are not using the sensors. But if we give a software update to the brain, then the sensors become active, and they can start doing something new for you, and then with that software, you can gather this data. So I think it's, it's sort of like the fact that, for example, with the brain that controls my top, I can also control her top, but her top has less lighting and less sensors than this one. It's, it's sort of like really... How, we built an ecosystem around it mm -hmm. so that if you're like living with somebody else that has the same garment, you can like swap brains and like gift each other a new pattern or right. a new effect. So I think it's really it's like the modularity is very important. And the other thing that we didn't say is that they're washable. Because I think the big, big stigma against wearable technology over the past 15 years is that everybody thinks, OK, the wires, the massive battery, they're not there anymore. But then the people think, well, maybe you still cannot wash it. And instead, no, you can actually wash it in the washing machine. For example, while we were waiting for the models to get dressed, we had the mini skirt sitting on a chair backstage. And somehow, a huge amount of water came down from the ceiling and just splashed all over it. So we just pat it down, dried it, and Amish is wearing it. So I think it's important to make things that are wearable and washable, because you want to go around and you want to smell good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what about you? you? You came from the MIT Aero Astro department, and now you're working with French craftsmen. That, you know, that, that, <laughs> how was that journey? No, but I, I think so. We have to look at the product uh, on its uh, entire um, extent. So the product is made of hardware, software, application on mobile phones, so remote from the hardware uh, platform. So all these aspects are evolving, are, are upgradable. So there is a big new promise of having connected 
expected things, and which is often assumed when we, we talk about wearables, is that these things can be upgraded, uh, not only for bug fixing, but also to add new features, which we've done. And I think it's a, it's a new possibility. Now, when you're, uh, when you're talking about the clash between you know, the fashion industry and the, and the tech industry, is, is really uh, what we see is that uh, being genuine about the fusion that we are looking, and not trying to accessorizing a, a piece of technology, because uh, you're almost lost you know, at the first step. Uh, so uh, if you are intent to really build or design attractive or you know, part of fashion uh, uh, piece of device or accessories, you have to work with, uh, from the very beginning with people and experts from this, this world, which, again, is not an afterthought, uh, and it, it does not really fly very high to just accessorizing a piece of technology. Yeah. I agree. And I know that, you know, Nikolai, for the Dash, you did a very successful Kickstarter campaign, which allows your company to have a different kind of structure. You know, you've, you're, not, you're not tied to a particular tech company investing it. And so how has that changed your, the model of how your business runs and the product that you're developing? So usually we would get a lot of um, pressure from, from existing tech companies in, in doing what they think or seem to be the right thing to do. Um, luckily, we were able to avoid that also by our later funding, um, that we are not influenced by any of the tech giants. We, we can do what we want, uh, and we can take some of the hard choices they want to make. Um, it's not just about selling a huge amount of product, it's about selling a product that is relevant to the one who's buying it. And when you were asking about the, the, the challenges before, I, I think that we've come to a point where we just try to sell a lot of shit that it's not relevant. It's, it's just pushing it down people's throats, and it has no relevancy. Um, and I think that's the wrong way to do it. Um, and making the right choices is, is what I am able to do now, hopefully. Right, and I, the idea of crowdfunding, uh, you know, yes. people voted with their money, basically, that this was the right yeah. product. And we, we, we did some, uh, some testing before, and, and, and we went to some retailers, we went to, uh, to potential investors, and we showed this thing to them, and they said, well, nobody's going to buy it. And we said, well, we think they are. We've made loads of products before. We think that people love it. And they said, well, no, we can't sell it. It, it. We don't have a shelf for it. So we can't put it on a shelf. And we can't put a name on it that people know. So we can't sell it. Right. And, and Kickstarter brought a voice of the people that, that found our product relevant and told them, well, you're wrong. We, we love the thing, uh, or at least love the, perp or the promise of it. Um, and in that way, we were able to generate a new product or make a new product, a new experience that is a truly new category of product. Yeah, uh, I think and otherwise, we wouldn't have succeeded. Right. This area is you know, fully equipped to take advantage of all the disruptive uh, movements around e-commerce. You know, it's perfectly positioned in that way. So it's, it's kind of fascinating changing that model. Also changing the way that you can actually make more money cutting out the, the wholesaling and the retailing in that way as well. So I just want to wrap up with one last question, which is actually something that I, um, the first thing I ask my, my um, graduate students when I'm talking about you know, this area of fashion tech. And it's really that you know, we're moving into this century of you know, superpowers. This was coming up yesterday. And you know, nowhere is it more kind of appropriate to think about superpowers than about the sort of uh, the augmentation of the human body. And so, you know, if, if we're sort of releasing ourselves from the current state of technology and how, what we know about electronics and really thinking about the future of, you know, the possibilities inside of biology and, you know, and new materiality, um, what are the most kind of salient issues that we need to address with human augmentation? Um, and basically, you know, what's your chosen superpower? I want to fly. Okay. <laughs> so, that next, um, the flying dress. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, like you can. I, yeah, you want to go ahead? No, no, go ahead. So I, I, I think that the value that I bring is, is, is the ability that I bring to the table plus the time I have to do so. Uh, there's a, a quite famous uh, longevity researcher called Aubrey de Grey, who thinks that the first children are born that will become 250 years old and the generation after them will become a thousand years old. It might sound ridiculous, I'm, I'm not doing the research, I, I wouldn't know, but if you, instead of having 30 productive years out of your 90 years, you'd have 960 productive years. You'd want to improve your ability. Like you have the time, you want to improve your ability, and um, I'm a really poor singer, I, I draw really badly. Um, there's a lot of things I'm really not very good at, 
but I think my brain would be able to do so if it wasn't because of the disability of my, my hands and my mouth. So if I had the ability to transform my thoughts and sort my thoughts and communicate those thoughts to my highest ability, that would be the superpower I would like to the most. So the neurological to physicality kind of transition. Yeah, we haven't yes. even we didn't even have time to dig into injectables and you know how we're going to work under the skin and, and all that. So yeah, that's that's a fascinating one. Anybody else? Can you say something? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I I think that when I fantasize about wearables of the future, I often think that they will prepare you for chaos. So in a way that like all the unexpected things in the world, you don't have to be annoyed by them, but you don't have to silence them either. Because uh, we were speaking with a philosopher once, and she said, uh, for the sake of control, we're willing to make the entire world artificial. And I thought that was a very um, powerful warning, because I don't think it's necessary to shut out the world. I think it's uh, wearables help us engage the world oh. and uh, make us feel at home on our planet. And I think that that's a very nice vision for wearables. Yeah, I think it's like a, mostly like a vision of human connectedness. So, what we are we going to have a device that just allows me to understand any language, mm -hmm. or I, am I going to have a device that just like by sitting nearby Cedric or Ryan, then I know what sort of what they're thinking, and maybe we have something in common. Like maybe he's thinking, oh, tonight I'm going to a rock concert, or maybe Cedric is thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to the same concert. Let's go together. So it's really like something that sort of lets you mind read what people around you are doing, so that you can connect on a more like deeper emotional level. Right, and very much in a, a spatial connection as well. So that's one of the things, you know, we, we are continuously going to keep living on our physical bodies. Mm. <laughs> and this is one thing that wearables will have to address. So, yeah. um, I will leave it to you. You're, you're nothing? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, um, thanks. <laughs> thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll talk later about it. I'm going to find out what. Uh, no. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, really excited to see all your products in the market in the future, and I think there's going to be great stuff ahead. So thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah.